You're about to listen to another inspiring word from House on the Rock Church, the London Lighthouse. For more information and interaction with House on the Rock, please visit our website on hotr.org.uk. Hi friends, welcome to the official House on the Rock London YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, why not subscribe right now and turn the notifications on so you know whenever we are live. I'm super excited about the message you are about to hear. Yes, 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 indeed, you will be blessed. I want to say a quick thank you to all those that support us to make this happen. If you want to join them in supporting us, please take advantage of the various ways in which you can give that are showing on the screen right now. But let me get out of your face so you'll be blessed by the word. See you afterwards. God bless you. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 9 of Zechariah chapter 4. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. Blessed be God. Woo! Let's rise up for the reading of God's word as a good custom in all house on the rock churches. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 to 9. I read in your hearing. Woo! Holy Spirit, thank you. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor you'll finish it, you'll finish it, you'll finish it. That thing you started, you are going to to finish. Hallelujah. Please stay standing with me for a few moments unless uh, you need to sit down. Please just stay with me for a few moments. Zachariah was facing an intimidating mountain that seemed to be immovable. He had been tasked with rebuilding the temple and the work had stalled. The odds were stacked against him that he would be able to finish this work. And the discouragement was very real. Time was running out, you know, like you right now. You can't believe that you're in December. Uh, you're like, how did we get here? January was just yesterday. Uh, there were certain things I thought I would be done. And now there's not enough time anymore. The, the odds were stacked against Zerubbabel. But then a word of encouragement came from the Lord to him. He said, first of all, it said, look not to your own might and strength, for that's not where your deliverance is. He said it would be by the Spirit of the Lord that the odds would be defeated. In other words, he was saying it's going to be by supernatural means uh, that you are going to get the W, uh, which is the win. Uh, hallelujah. And just in case you don't know what spirit we are talking about, he says that when you are getting this victory, the shouts that you are going to hear is grace, grace, grace to it, uh, meaning uh, that the spirit is the spirit of grace uh, that will grant you the victory for victory. Hallelujah. It's going to be by the grace of God. If you believe it, come and shout yes. The grace of God is sufficient. It's interesting to note that he talks about a capstone. Now a capstone is a stone that is fixed on top of something, the final stone to complete the building. But then he goes on to talk about the hands that laid the foundation of this temple would also be the hands that would finish it. But the design of the temple in Bible days, days did not have a capstone. It didn't have a steeple that you now put the final stone upon. So what capstone is he talking about? I'll tell you the capstone I believe he was talking about. He's talking about the cornerstone. Ah, uh, yes, the cornerstone. Uh, the rejected cornerstone. Ah, uh, why? Because the though the cornerstone would seem to not be the final stone in the building, uh, he still calls it the capstone. Uh, because the cornerstone is both the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, yes. And once the cornerstone, oh, Lord Jesus, I hope you get this. You see, the cornerstone 
is the stone that you, you use to secure the foundation and st- secure the pillar. So it's not the stone that you use at the end. Meanwhile, he's calling this cornerstone the capstone, the final stone. What he's implying is that once the cornerstone was laid, the building was finished. <laughs> oh, you don't hear me what I'm saying. <laughs> Once the enemy allowed the cornerstone to be laid, the building was finished. Because the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, is the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. If he offered it, he will finish it. I came to encourage somebody this Sunday morning. I simply came to tell you, you will finish strong. Help me tell your neighbor, you will finish strong. You will finish strong. Preach to the person around you. You will finish strong. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, help me. Speak through me like only you can today. In Jesus' mighty name, we do pray. And the people shouted aloud, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Woo! We're going to move fast. Stay with me. There are many analogies that are used to illustrate the Christian life in the Bible. Um, Sometimes we are called bond servants. Uh, We are called sons and daughters. We are called lively stones. We are called uh, the planting of the Lord. We are called the building of the Lord. We are called soldiers, all of which to try to bring to ho- home to us what the Christian life is, you know. Uh, but my analogy of interest today is that every believer is a runner. Tell your neighbor you are a runner. You are a runner. You are a, you are a runner. Because the Christian life is in fact a race, and we are called to run. In the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, I read verse 24 to verse 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race uh, all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain, and everyone who competes for the prize is moderate or disciplined or temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus. So Paul says he runs. Not with uncertainty. Thus I fight. Not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I should become disqualified. So this scripture reveals or gives uses the analogy of the fact that we are running a race. We are running a race. That we are all engaged in a race. That every believer is actually a runner on a race. Not running for a perishable crown, but running for an imperishable crown of glory at the end of their race now. Uh, You must understand, uh, I know we live in a a day and age where people give you certificates for participation. Um, And I understand the philosophy or the psychology behind that. uh, In other words, to encourage people, at least you participated. But can I tell you something about this Christian race uh, that we are engaged in? There is no certificate for participation. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. You are meant to run this race in order to win. You are not going to get an award for simply being part of the race. Uh, You don't run to get a participation certificate. Uh, You run to win. I came to tell somebody this Sunday morning, I'm in it to win it. I'm running to win. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know whether I'm talking to anybody yet. Do I have any runners to win uh, under the sound of my voice? Uh, if it's you I'm talking about, come and shout yes. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't start this uh, just to start it. Uh, I started it to finish it. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, I've paid too much. I've gone through too much uh, to now not get to the end. I don't know. Am I talking to anybody? He didn't bring me out of Egypt uh, and I wouldn't enter into uh, the promised land. I'm not of the company of those that will remain caught up in the wilderness. Uh, I'm in it to win it. Uh, if it's you I'm talking about, come on, shout, yeah. 
Uh, Paul goes on uh, and he says uh, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 2, uh, I went up by revelation and communicated to them that, that gospel which I preach unto the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run. So again, he talk, calls himself a runner. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16, he says, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I, ha that I have not run in vain, nor labored in vain. Again, he uses the analogy of of running. Paul talks about himself as somebody that is running. Uh, he reaffirms that the Christian life is actually a race. In 2 Timothy and chapter 4 and verse 7, as he's rounding up his life, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished what? The race. I have kept the faith. So in other words, he says, I've finished my, the race. The Christian life is a race. Oh yes. And henceforth is laid up for me a crown of glory. Help me tell your neighbor, in case you didn't know it, uh, you are in a race. You are in a race. Uh, I am in a race. Uh, the Christian life is a race. Oh uh, uh, yeah, but this is no ordinary race. Uh, uh, this is not a race uh, against you or against me. Uh, I'm not racing you. Uh, uh, tell your neighbor, I, uh, you're, you're not my competition. Uh, I'm not racing you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My race is unique. My race is different. different. Uh, the race uh, is not against you. Uh, we're not competing against one another. Uh, House on the Rock London, uh, you are in a race, but your race is not against uh, the church down the road or up the street. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, for those that compare themselves with themselves, uh, they are not wise. Uh, let me tell you the first thing uh, about your, your race. Uh, your race is against time. Oh, uh, Jesus. Uh, because we have have limited time on this side of eternity to fulfill purpose and attain to our destiny. So your race uh, is against time. The clock is chicken. Ah, uh, yes. This race is a race to fulfill destiny and attain to our purpose. This is a race to live, leave the earth empty. Ah, uh, yeah. Now, people measure life with various barometers, uh, but life is not adequately or accurately measured by duration, how long you live, because no, no matter how long you live, if you have no impact, what was the point of the length? Uh, life is not accurately measured uh, by acquisition, uh, by how many things you are able to acquire, because whatever you acquire, you are going to leave behind. Uh, life is not accurately measured by station, that is your positions, uh, whether you became CEO, director, king of the hill, uh, because whatever position you occupy, you're going to leave it behind, uh, and within a blink of an eyelid, somebody else is going to take over over that position. Uh, uh, can I tell you what I believe? I believe that life is most accurately measured uh, by donation. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, not by duration, uh, not by acquisition, uh, not by station, uh, but by donation. Uh, how much you donated, how much you gave, uh, how much impact you had, uh, how much value you added. Uh, this is the race we are running against time to fulfill purpose. Uh, tell your neighbor you are running against it's time to fulfill uh, purpose. Uh and then we read in Hebrews and chapter 12 and verse 1, wherefore seeing that we are encompassed by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race that is set before us. Oh, Jesus. There's a race that is set before you. It says, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Tell, you, tell your neighbor you have a set race. You have a set race. It says uh, the race that is set before us. Listen to the thing it said before. It says let us lay aside every sin and every weight. The, every, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that doth so easily beset us. That means that there are weights and sins that are tailor made for you. Oh Lord. That's why you need to be a bit careful about judging somebody that is struggling in a particular area. Because that might just be that person area. Uh, when you are looking down your nose at him in that area, uh, just take, take, take a bit of time and we'll find out what your own area is. Uh, 
Ayakaboto Soto. I, I must confess there are some temptations I don't understand. I don't know how somebody falls for certain types of temptation because they don't, they don't appeal to me. Uh, yeah, but I'm careful not to judge them because there are some other types of temptation uh, that are my Achilles heel uh, that I know I gotta be careful. And somebody else might look at that area of my temptation and think that, oh, nah, what's wrong with him? Can't he just say no? <laughs> because there is a weight and a sin that does so easily beset you. But listen to that. That also lets you know that you have a unique race that is set for you. That it is not why it's not wise to be comparing yourself with somebody else because their race, uh, though generically is the same Christian race, uh, it is unique to them. Uh, oh, so she got married at 25, uh, and you are now 42, and you ain't married yet, uh, and now you're looking down on yourself. No, 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 she's running her race. Uh, you got your your own race uh, to run. Oh, you don't hear me? What I'm saying. Uh, so he became a millionaire and his business bust out uh, on every side at 32. Uh, and here you are, uh, clocking 50. Uh, and you can hardly put two coins together. And you're saying, God, this ain't fair. No, that's his race. Uh, you got your race. Uh, there's a race that is set for you. Uh, there's a race that is unique. Race. Run your 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 race, run your race. Listen to what it said. It says, uh, let us run our race uh, with patience. Oh, Lord. That immediately lets me know, listen to me, your race is not a hundred meters dash. No, no, no. It's not a short race. Uh, this Christian race, uh, this Christian life, uh, it's a marathon. Uh, it's the longest marathon ever. Uh, and that's why you need patience. Tell your neighbor you need patience. Uh, that has almost become a curse word in the world we're living in today. Christians don't want to hear anything about patience. But the truth is, you need patience. Hebrews in chapter 6 said that you need to be followers of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. It doesn't just take faith. It also takes what? Patience. You need both faith and patience to inherit the promise. The scripture says elsewhere, let patience have her perfect work that you might be entire, complete, lacking nothing. Tell your neighbor, be patient, be patient, be patient. Uh, uh, your turn is coming. Your glory is coming. Your breakthrough is coming. Your blessing is coming. Amen. Come on. Do I have any patient people under the sound of my voice? Come and shout, yeah. Woo Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Hebrews chapter, 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 hallelujah. It, it, it says that we should, not, we should be patient. Uh, we should be patient. Uh, but, and so our Christian life is not a hundred meters dash. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. You are engaged in a marathon race as a believer. And in every race, uh, there are finish lines. There are finish lines. There are finish lines. Uh, I like to call them... There are, they, there are checkpoints. There are checkpoints. There are checkpoints. You see, when you interview real marathon runners, they'll tell you that they have checkpoints, and their coaching team has checkpoints in the race before the final finish line. They have checkpoints where they check how they are doing. Okay, where you should be at the 100 meters mark, where you should be at the 1,500 meter mark, you know, checkpoints uh, along this race. The, the checkpoints are mini finish lines. And this is how uh, real life is. Real life is full of checkpoints, checkpoints. Uh, our final finish line is when we pass on to glory. But in the course of your Christian life, this marathon Christian life race, uh, you have checkpoints. Uh, somebody say checkpoints, checkpoints. Uh, you have checkpoints. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, the closure of a season and the beginning of another is a 
checkpoint. It's a checkpoint. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you're at a checkpoint. You just didn't know it. Uh, whisper to your neighbor, you're at a checkpoint. You just didn't know it. The closure of a year is a checkpoint. It's, it's, a, it's a checkpoint. Oh, my goodness. Oh, we are at a checkpoint. I am at a checkpoint. Oh, my, 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 my. Uh, Lamy, please quickly come and help me. Uh, Minister Lamy, Pastor God's will, quickly come and help me here. You stay on either side of me. Hallelujah. Just a little bit of distance, a little bit of distance. Hallelujah. Now, uh, he is where I want to be. He is where I used to be. At the close of every year, at the end of a season and the beginning of another, I will encounter a checkpoint. A checkpoint. Uh, now, the challenge with most of us at checkpoints is that our checkpoints, our preoccupation is with where we want to be, that we are not at yet. And we therefore become a little bit depressed. Uh, discouraged at the checkpoint because we're still seeing such a gap between where we are and where we want to be. Uh, the, the discouragement is real. Am I talking to anybody? Some people don't like it when their birthday is around the corner because their birthday is a checkpoint. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. So at the checkpoint of their birthday, they're like, oh, my, another year, another year. Uh, how far gone am I? Oh God, I thought I'll be there by now. I ain't there by now. And we start to feel depressed. Uh, some people don't like separately celebrating their birthdays at all. Uh, and it's very typical at the end of the year. People don't like the end of the year. Uh, once December is around the corner, a lot of people are like, oh God, another December. Ah, how did we get here? Uh, it's not a cliche. They are very, very serious. They're thinking, that caught another year. Ah, somebody is getting old. Jesus. Hey, where am I? Why? Because the perspective is a perspective of, oh, where I should be that I am not yet. Uh, so we become depressed or discouraged. There's a lot of discouragement typically at times like this, but that devil is a liar. Oh, yeah. But before I go to the happy side, I've got to still teach you and tell you the truth uh, that you need checkpoints. Tell your neighbor you need checkpoints. Uh, you need checkpoints. Uh, oh, yes, you need checkpoints. Uh, I know sometimes it's uncomfortable uh, to check it, uh, to examine it, uh, to assess it, uh, but you've got to do it uh, because there's no growth uh, without a check. Oh, Lord. There's no growth without a check. You've got to check it. You've got to check out how you are doing, where you are. Ah, yes. You've got to do the hard work of doing some self-analysis, some introspection. Oh, how come it's always everybody else that's at fault? When will you wake up and realize that you've got to assess yourself? Do some SWOT analysis. It might be uncomfortable. But if you really want to grow, you're going to have to check it. Come on, tell your neighbor, check yourself, check yourself. Check yourself. Come on, check that attitude. Uh, check your character. Check your prayer life. Check your study of the word. Check your commitment to God. Check your giving and your sacrifice. You've got to check it. Tell your neighbor, check it. You've got to check it. Oh my goodness, there are many things you need to check. You need to check your spirit. You need to check your soul. You need to check your body. Yeah, some of the conclusions in checking might not be pleasurable, but you've got to know the state of your flocks in order to be able to now chart your way forward. Come on, somebody once again shout, check it! got to check it. you got to check it. Um, minister, pastor, still stay with me. I, I, I'm not done yet. you got to check your relationships. 
Oh, yes. Uh, we, we are at a checkpoint, uh, even in the United Kingdom. Uh, right now, we are at a checkpoint. Uh, just this week uh, or so, uh, a report came out uh, showing uh, that the, the, the amount of Christians in this nation, uh, for the first time in its history, is below 50% uh, of the population. Checkpoint, checkpoint. Uh, not as if that was our goal, uh, to always be above 50%. I don't know who set that as an award, but nonetheless, it's a checkpoint. Ah, uh, yeah. And we really should not be surprised at that result or that outcome when we are living in an a day, day and age where evangelism is on the decline, where believers are taught that their faith is a private matter and they should not share it with anybody else, where believers have embraced the ideology or the philosophy. I don't invite people to church. That's between me and God. Why should we then be surprised? Surprised when there is a downturn in amount of people committed to the Christian faith. Oh uh, yeah, when we have peddled religious dogma instead of the true gospel of grace and salvation. When those that even say they are Christians are committed to so many other things primarily, while the commitment to God and to his house is secondary and a matter of convenience, we should not be surprised. Somebody shout, checkpoint, checkpoint, checkpoint. It's a wake up call. It's an arise and shine signal in the land. Don't avoid checkpoints. Avoiding checkpoints is avoiding your own growth. Ah, uh, yes. But when you're at a checkpoint, don't only engage the perspective of analyzing the gap between where you are and where you want to be. Also make sure you take some time out <laughs> to look at your checkpoint in the light of where you were. <laughs> and where you now are. Oh Lord, I know what I was hear me this Sunday morning. Because when I look back, <laughs> I'm not where I used to be. Uh, I've made some movement. Oh, God. I've learned some things. I've grown through the process. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm not as sharp-mouthed as I used to be. Ah, oh, God. I'm not as irritable as I used to be. Uh, I'm not as complacent as I used to be. I might not be there yet, but I'm definitely not where I used to be. Oh my goodness. Well, it is high time that we awake from the dead and arise for our salvation, listen, is closer than when we first believed. So at this point in time, whenever the winds or the breeze of discouragement starts to blow around you, you need to look back and see how far God has brought you and start to give God thanks. Hey, is there anybody ready to give God thanks? Under the sound of my voice, I'm not where I used to be. God has moved me. I'm not as weak as I used to be. God has strengthened me. I'm not as sick as I used to be. God has healed me. Is there any grateful person under the sound of my voice? Come and give God the praise. And I can, can I tell you something, uh, something mysterious, uh, that it is in thanking God uh, for how far he has brought you uh, that now fills you with fresh momentum uh, to take you uh, to where you want him to take you to. Uh, if there's anybody ready to move from where they are to where God wants them to be, come on, go ahead and give God the praise. Give God the praise, give God the praise, give God the praise. So your perspective in your checkpoint should not just be the perspective of I'm not where I want to be yet. It should also be the perspective of I'm not where I used to be. But there's an additional perspective that you've got to engage at the checkpoint. And that is the perspective of who promised you. Oh, Lord Jesus, I don't know where I'm whether anybody's hearing me this Sunday. You've, you've got to now look at it from another 
perspective. Uh, you don't just check where you used to be. You don't just check where you want to be. You also check who promised you. Uh, oh, God. Uh, you've got to look at your checkpoint in the light of him who pro- promised you. Who promised you? Uh, uh, God. God, right? Uh, so you've got to check God. Uh, you've got to check him. Uh, so Hebrews and chapter 11 and verse 11 tells us of Sarah who got pregnant uh, at the ripe old age of nine. It says, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Uh, While you are in the checkpoint of the end of the year, you've got to check God. You've got to assess God. You've got to look at God. You've got to check him out. And when you check him out, you must come to the irrevocable conclusion that I judge him faithful. If he promised it, that means that he's going to do it. Come on, somebody give him the praise. Does anyone judge God faithful? Under the sound of my voice, come and shout, yeah. Uh, Romans 4 and verse 21, it says about Abraham being fully persuaded that he that had promised was also able to perform. If he promised it, he has the ability to perform it. God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should repent. If he has said it, he will do it. If you believe it, Come on, shout yeah! And this brings us back to Hebrews in chapter uh, 12, verse 1 and 2. He says, Wherefore, seeing that we're encompassed by so great a cloud of witnesses, uh, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. You see, that's the problem. You stop looking at Jesus. <laughs> that's the problem. You, you kept on looking at where you're coming from. You kept on looking at where you want to go that you are not yet. You, you stop looking at Jesus. He said, looking unto Jesus. Oh, the, the way to handle your checkpoint is get your eyes on Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Uh, you're going to have various checkpoints in life. I tell you the truth, I lie not. You're going to have various checkpoints, various moments that are going to be checkpoints. The way to handle the checkpoint effectively is looking unto Jesus. But it didn't stop there. It said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, thank you. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, brothers. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Can I preach this thing like I feel it? Uh, Hallelujah. Looking unto Jesus, I check him and I judge him faithful. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. Uh, Meaning, therefore, Ugubalataya, he's not just the author, he's also the finisher. Uh, (laughs) Meaning, therefore, uh, if he authored it, uh, he's going to finish it. Uh, He's a finisher. No, he's not just a finisher. He is the finisher. He's not the God of abandoned projects. Uh, There are many countries where you go around and you see all sorts of abandoned projects. Not so with my God. If he authored it, he will finish it. So Paul says to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If he begun it, he will complete it. Once you know that he began it, you can be confident and take it to the bank that he will complete it. Luke chapter 1 and verse 45, talking about Mary, says, Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things that were told her from the Lord. If you believe, there will be a performance. I came to provoke a performance of God's word in your life. 
even today in the mighty name of Jesus I prophesy there will be a performance somebody shall yeah it gets sweeter because in Romans chapter 9 and verse 28 we read for he will finish the work he's not just an author he's the finisher he says he will finish the work and he will cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth Ah, the Lord will finish what he has started but the additional benefit in this in this scripture is that he will cut it short in righteousness I see a cutting short. Do you know what it means to cut it short? That means he's going to reduce the time span it takes to get it done. That means he's going to fast forward. That means he's going to accelerate it. That means what was meant to take multiple months, it will be done in this month. If you believe it, come and shout amen. I know they're telling you there are not enough days left in December with all the holidays and the breaks for your process to be done and for you to get that thing. But if my God created the heavens and the earth and recreated it in just six days, can I announce to you there are too many days in December, too long for God to work. Ah, in just one day, he can turn your life around. He can turn that situation around. If you believe it, come and shout, yeah! Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. But, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Sit down, we're just talking. I, 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 I need to correct myself. Uh, there's been an error in my homily so far. Uh, God is not going to finish it. God, God is not going to finish it. No, no, no. He's not going to finish it. Why? Because he has already finished it. Oh, Jesus. Uh, it is from man's perspective that we talk about he will finish it. And the reason we say he will is because we have not yet entered into the experience of the finishing. So we put it into the future that he will. That's okay, understandable. I know where you're coming from. You are a man. But when God says he will, he actually means I have. Why? Because he's omnipresent. He lives outside of time. So unlike a man who makes you a promise of what he will do, when God makes you a promise, he's telling you what he has already done, you have simply not lived long enough or walked into the done work. Oh, Jesus. So it's not that he will finish it. It is that he has already finished it. In John chapter 19 and verse 30, on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Okay? He said, he did not say it will be finished. He said that it is finished. Oh, Jesus. Uh, that was 2,000 years ago, right? Or oh, so. So, if it, it is finished or it was finished then, it means that it is finished now. Oh, Jesus. He, he didn't say it will be. He said, I've already done it. It is finished. I've fulfilled the, 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 all the righteous requirements of God. I've completed the story. It is finished. As he was slain on the cross, he said, it is finished. But yet in Revelations in chapter 13 and verse 8, he talks about the latter part and he says, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, what lamb is this? He's talking about Jesus, that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the earth. But we know that Jesus wasn't slain until 2,000 years ago. But he's saying that he was slain from the foundation of the earth because this is the way God works. God does not live in time. God lives outside of time. Before he even set everything in motion, he had already slain the lamb. Before you committed your first sin, before your great-great-great-grandfather was even born to line up the lineage that gave birth to you before you now sinned, he had already slain the lamb for your sin that you had not yet committed. Why? Because 
he always finishes before he starts. <laughs> he is the author and the finisher, but if we are to put it in God's perfect, uh, um, p- perspective and language, it should really be he's the finisher and the author. He finishes it, and then he authors it. Uh, Whenever you see God starting something, it means that he has already completed it. And that's why he will call the cornerstone, which is meant to be a foundation stone, also the capstone. Oh, Lord. You see, if he started it, take it to the bank, it's done. And therefore, because he finished, I can finish. The reason I have the audacity and the confidence that I will finish right, that I will finish strong, is because he finished. Because he finished, I will finish. Come on, I, I, I permit you to have a little bit of attitude right now, with a little bit of attitude. Tell your neighbor, because he finished, <laughs> I will finish. His finish has made my finish possible. Hallelujah. Somebody go ahead and give God the glory. Give him the praise. Even today, lift up his holy name. Lift up his holy name. We are about to go to the communion table. And the communion table is all about the finished work. It's a depiction of what was done. It is saying it is finished. And because he finished, I will finish. I prophesy, I decree and declare over your life, you will finish this year strong. Oh my. My God is going to surprise you in the next number of days. He's going to, he's going to show up and is going to show off in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh my goodness, uh, you are going to finish strong. You're going to finish on top. I know you've been through the fire. I know you've been through the flood. I know unexpected and terrible things happen to you, but you are going to finish strong in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He that believeth shall see the performance of those things that were spoken to him or her by the voice of the Lord. This is a season of performance. It's a season of performance. It's a season of performance. You will see the performance of the Lord in your life, in the mighty name of Jesus. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you're out there, you haven't accepted Jesus Christ yet as your Lord and Savior, this is your moment, this is your opportunity. Facebook, YouTube, here in the hall. Don't harden your heart. He's already paid the price. He's already finished so that you too can finish. Why not accept that wonderful work that has been done on your behalf? Repeat these words of prayer after me. Lord Jesus, today I repent of my sin and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe with my heart, I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. Thank you, Lord. As I have spoken, it is done. I am saved in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. We bless the Lord. If you pray that prayer, whether online or in person, please get in touch with us and let's help you to grow from being a child to becoming a mature son of God. Hey friends, I trust that you were blessed by that word. You will finish strong because he finished, you will finish and you'll finish strong also. He that has begun this good work in you, he's going to bring it to completion. Please share the message with other people so they can be blessed also. And if you want to support us in what we do, please take advantage of the various ways in which you can do so now showing on the screen. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to being here with you again real soon. God bless you. We hope you've enjoyed this uplifting sermon from House on the Rock Church, the London Lighthouse. We hope you've been informed and inspired 
Join us for services every Wednesday and Sunday. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at HOTR London. Also, live stream our services on YouTube at HOTR London. For more information, visit our website on hotr.org.uk.